Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and see what the Apostle Paul says concerning the church. Beginning at verse 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul writes, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. One member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. One of the problems that the church there in Corinth, and we've already seen this, one of the problems the church there in Corinth suffered with was a problem of division. Paul had made it very clear in his introduction in chapter 1, when he got to chapter 3, he had said in verses 3 and 4, To the Corinthian church, you are still carnal, for where there are envying, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For while one says, I'm of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? And so he said there is carnality, there is division within the body of Christ. And he was speaking concerning that. Now, he had been wanting to remind the Corinthians of something that the church needs to be reminded of pretty much often. He wanted to remind the church of their spiritual unity. In 1 Corinthians ten seventeen, he had said, We being many are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. And so he wanted the body of Christ there in the city of Corinth, as well as all of us who are reading this letter 2,000 years later, he wanted us to know that unity, is very important in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is to be one in the Lord because the body of Christ stands in unity in opposition to the enemy. It's been said Satan always hates Christian fellowship. It is his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything that can divide saints from one another, he delights in. He attaches far more importance to godly fellowship than we do. Since union is strength, he does his best to promote separation. Now, that's absolutely true. Of course, it is. The Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 12, 25 said, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If the enemy wants to do a work against, uh, against the Lord, what does he do? He sows seeds of discord and division in the body of Christ. He wants the house to be divided against itself. He doesn't want the body of Christ to have unity and fellowship. He doesn't want us to have singleness of heart and purpose. Because if we do, then we're going to be great enemies of his kingdom. The Bible makes it very clear that God desires his people to dwell together in peace and in unity, even as it says in Psalm 133.1. One. 
Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And so God's desire for us, the body of Christ, is to be one in Him. Jesus wants us to be united in Him. He even prayed that we would be. Remember His high priestly prayer in John 17, how He said in verses 20 and 21, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in Me through their word, that they all may be one, as You, Father, are in Me and I in You that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. The world will believe partly because the body of Christ gets along, because the church loves one another, because we stand in stark contrast to a world that is filled with division and, and filled with anger and, and a lack of unity. We, the body of Christ, are intended by Jesus Christ to be united together in opposition to the enemy, and to be cemented by love. So we need to protect the unity of the body that we have. That's something that we actually decide to do because we've been called by God to learn to love one another. When Paul was writing to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, he said, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And so that's supposed to be my responsibility to do the very best I can to live at peace with other believers. It works in the house. If I live at peace with my wife, there'll be unity within the house. There'll be love in the house. The Spirit of God won't be quenched in our house. But if we're constantly at each other's throats, if we're always arguing, if we're always in opposition to one another, not only does it divide us from one another, but if we're parents, it's also going to divide our children's hearts. And so unity is of utmost importance. Now, when you're talking about spiritual unity, we need to immediately say unity does not mean uniformity. We're not clones of one another. Every one of us have distinct gifts, and every one of us have different callings in, in the body of Christ. Unity can be expressed in diversity, and Paul's about to demonstrate this, and that's what he's speaking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now notice with me in verse 12 how he begins here in 1 Corinthians 12 by saying, As a body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So he begins by emphasizing the interrelationship of each member of the body of Christ. It's interesting, if you were to look at verses 12 to 27 in this passage here, he chooses to use the word body some 18 times. What he's wanting to refer to is the fact that we are already together in Jesus Christ. We are supposed to be one because God designed us that way. So when he speaks about us being the body of Christ, it would speak of the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. He echoes that sentiment, that thought in Romans chapter 12 at verse 5, when he says, we being many are one body in Christ and every member, every one member's of one another. He says the same kind of thing in Colossians 1.18 when he speaks of Jesus in this way. He is the head of the body, the church. So he's making it very clear that we are in Christ and therefore are called the body of Christ. The church is called a variety of things in Scripture. Obviously, we're referred to as the church. Uh, we're the bride of Christ. We're also called the body or the body of Christ. And so we are the body of Christ and he's making it very clear here, especially in verse 12, that Christ's body is one. So we who are in Christ are to be one in him. Now, we are not a social club. We are not a sports team. We're members of one another. You can be part of a fraternity. You can be part of a, some organization like uh, the Moose or Elk, some lodge. You can be part of, uh, you know, a union. There's a variety of things you can be part of that do not require you to love one another. If you play sports and you're on a team and the manager gets you together and you begin to have a, a team kind of talk, the manager isn't going to look to the first baseman and say, you know, man, you've got to love that right fielder out there. He's just not going to do that, you know. Second baseman, you've got to just love that catcher. It, it doesn't work that way. You don't have to. What you need to be is adept at your position. 
You don't even have to love the team that you're on. If you're a professional athlete, you probably don't even care about the team that much because what you're looking for is the best salary you're going to make. That's the way it works. We understand that. Teams are that way. To be successful, though, the better teams have a fondness for one another. They enjoy being together. There's just something about that camaraderie. But if you are part of some secular organization, they cannot make you love one another. If you're in the military and you've got a fighting unit that you're part of, they don't say to you, you know, Rosales, you've got to love this guy over here. As a matter of fact, that's frowned on in the military. What you're supposed to do is just be supportive of the mission. Be good at your job. Be willing to do the things you've been trained to do. If you have a fondness for that guy, that's all the better. Chances are you won't leave him on the field if he's injured. But the bottom line is it's not required. When I took my oath of fealty to the United States, they did not say, and I will love my fellow soldier. I didn't have to swear to do that. I was going to uphold and honor the Constitution and, and be in opposition to the enemies of the United States. That's part of our, of our oath. But I wasn't, I wasn't told, you've got to love your fellow soldiers. I wasn't told that because I don't have to. It's a choice I make. But the church is different. We are commanded by God to love one another. The body of Christ is different. We are actually going to demonstrate that we know God by the love we have one for another. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you love one another. And so the body of Christ is one and the unity of the body is to be protected. We endeavor to keep the unity of the body and the spirit of peace, and we do so by love because we are the body of Christ. That's what the church is called to be, and that's what we're called to do. We are the visible body of Christ. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn to love one another. And you do learn to love one another, don't you? I mean, those of us who are married in this room know that the day that we got married, more than likely, when we we're giving our oath to one another, we we're making our promise before God. We said something like, I will love you, I will honor you, I will cherish you, etc. till death do we part, or something like that, whatever your, your vows if you're married were, something like that. But I made a promise. I made a promise to that woman when we got together, I will love you, and I'll do my best to be a good husband to you. But you know what? I didn't have a clue what I was saying. <laughs> I mean, he was saying it. I was repeating it. That was about it. I don't even remember my wedding day. I was in a fog. That was drunk. No, I was. And I'm just kidding. <laughs> drunk in love. No, I, I really don't remember that much about it. I do remember making promises. And I do remember thinking that I loved this young woman that I was making these promises to. But I, like all of you who are married or all of you who are in a relationship that's growing in its love for one another, know that if it really is love, then the next, next month, if you're still together, you're going to love each other more than you did the month before. And what happens over time, at least it's been true in my my case is you can actually say something like, I love you more today than I did yesterday. You can actually say that because you do. Because love has a tendency of continuing to grow. So you're committed, aren't you? If you're going to be married and remain married, you have to be committed, don't you? I mean, if you're not committed to being married, then what's the purpose of getting married? And if you're making promises, who are you making those promises to? See, for me, when I got married, I was making promises first to God. I was saying to God, I will care for your daughter. And I was afraid when I made those promises because it wasn't just to Marie. I was making a promise. I was making my oath to the Lord. Secondly, I was making my oath to this young woman. And thirdly, I was making my oath before witnesses. I was saying in front of those who came to the wedding that this woman that I'm looking at right now is going to be a woman I will be faithful to until Jesus takes me home. And I had an assumption that I would remain with her for a long, long time. And that's been the case. But I've discovered over time that love is something that grows. 
over time. So you're in a church, and you're beginning to meet some people around you. And somebody hurts your feelings. And before you know it, you just take yourself and you move someplace else because that person hurt me. Instead of working it out, instead of reconciling, instead of seeking a way for you to live in unity, you just get up and you just leave. You do that often enough, you go through what I call, you know, root shock. I know something of root shock because I'm somebody who's pretty good at killing plants. I can put a plant here, and I don't really think it looks so good there after a while. Then I would just dig it up. Then I'd put it somewhere else. I'd leave it there for a little while. Didn't really like it. Tried it again. The thing dies. The thing dies right there. Why? Because it goes through shock. You cannot have it rooted without it being grounded. It has to remain there. It has to be cared for. It has to be pruned. It has to be just taken care of. What makes me think that being in the church is much different than this taking care of the things like plants? It's really not a whole lot different when you think about it. You got to weed. You got to make sure that it's watered. Make sure it has the proper nutrients. You have to care for it. And if you do so, then that little plant's going to continue to grow and produce and it's going to be great because it's cared for. I killed a lot of plants. We moved into a house, and I've told you this before. Some of you have heard this. I had some ivy that the former owner had left in our backyard in a little pot. It was nice and green. And, and I would go every week, and I would take some water, and I'd water the plant, you know. And, man, that little plant was a good little plant. It's the only one that stayed alive and green all the time. And I really liked that plant. I really did. I thought, man, that's a good plant. I can still remember talking to it. It didn't say anything in return, but I, I said, you know, you're a good little plant. You know, I like you, man. You're a good plant. Well, I forgot to water it for about a month, maybe a month and a half. I just forgot. And I went into the backyard, and I saw this plant there, and it was green, still green. And I, I walked up to it, and I said, oh, man, I'm sorry, man. I haven't watered you. But look at you. You're still green. And, and I reached down, and like a little dog, I patted it. Man, you're a good little, it was plastic. The only reason that that thing stayed green, that's a true story, I'm not kidding. The only reason it stayed green, it, was, it, was, it wasn't even alive, it was just plastic. I learned some lessons about things like, I, I learned lessons in the most basic ways. If you neglect a real living thing, what does it do? It dies. If you neglect a real living relationship in the body of Christ, what's going to happen? It's going to fade away. So instead of us uprooting ourselves and running someplace else and trying to replant and uprooting ourselves, running someplace else and trying to replant, why don't we grow where we're planted? Why don't we mature in our faith in the Lord? Why don't we work through the problems that we have so that we can actually demonstrate that we know what it means to love one another? Paul is talking about that here in the body of Christ. He's saying, don't you understand that you are one in Jesus Christ? Don't you realize there's only one body? Now, how did I get to be part of that one body? Verse 13, he says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. How did we become one in the body of Christ? Well, he says that the Holy Spirit brought us into the body. In Galatians, chapter 3, verses 26 through 28, Paul echoed this by saying, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There's no difference. We're all one in him. I don't know if I should use this illustration. It can be misunderstood. I'll use it and take the chance because we're talking about the body of Christ and we're supposed to love one another, so you've got to love me, so I'm going to say it. 
before I got saved, before I got saved, there was a lot of revolution going on. There was a, an organization all of us have heard of called the Black Panthers that sprang into existence in the late 60s. There was, there were the Gray Panthers. I don't know how many of you have even heard of the Gray Panthers. They were a bunch of old people, seriously, and they called themselves the Gray Panthers. They had um, the Brown Beret, Native American groups. There are various groups that started at that time. One of my friends was one of the leaders of the Brown Beret. He was a leader in the Brown Beret. And uh, his brother and I were good friends in high school. And he tried to get me to be part of the Brown Beret because being Mexican-American myself, he wanted me to be part of this group that was going to fight for the rights of, of, of Mexicans and this and that. And I told him, no, I don't want to be part of that. Why not? Now, you have to understand, I was not a Christian at that time. But I said, because I really think people ought to be one. And I'm not really big on dividing humanity into sections and subsections. I think we need to work together in unity, don't you? Well, he didn't think so at all. And that splinterization of the United States has continued since the late 60s. So that instead of out of the many, one, we now have out of the one, many. And there's a lack of unity. That's in our world. It's splintered into class warfare, into ethnicities, into division. And so you have people who say, well, we don't have those kinds of people in our church. Here in this fellowship, I've done everything I can to always be a Christian first. That doesn't mean that I don't like my, uh, my heritage. I love my heritage. It doesn't mean that I don't um, you know, appreciate other people's heritages. I appreciate theirs. Do I think mine is the best? I like it. But I'm not going to say it's better than yours because that doesn't matter. What matters is who I am in Christ. What matters is who we are together in Jesus Christ. That's really what matters, you see. And again, I'll give you an old story, another stupid story, but there's enough of you in this room who probably haven't heard me say it maybe for a while. But just to illustrate, I went to Bible college, Biola. I'm in a philosophy class. There's a guy in the front row. I used to sit in the very back row. He sat in the very front row. There's about 100 students. Every time the, the teacher lectures, this guy raises his hand and interrupts the teacher. Always did it the same way. Always yelled out, brother, and he said it like that. Brother, brother. And it used to drive me crazy. Now, you need to understand, you know, I'm 23 years old. I'm a college freshman. I spent two years in the military. I spent several years in drugs and alcohol. I didn't have much patience with many people who interrupted teachers. I'm paying a whole lot of money to hear this class, and I don't want to hear brother every time I show up. That's the truth. And so every time the teacher would lecture and this guy would be in the front row, he would raise his hand when the teacher walked in front of him, and he'd say, brother, and he'd ask a question. And I used to put my pencil down, and I would fold my arms and lean back in my chair, and I'd wait for this to get over with so that we could get back to the lecture. But this guy did it every week, and it was driving me crazy. So finally, the guy seated next to me, here comes Mr. Old Brother, Old Brother, and this guy next to me writes a note and hands it to me, and, you know, I like you, do you like me? Yes, no, check the box. No, no. <laughs> They kicked him out of school. No, um, he hands me a note, and I open it up, and it says, what is he, a Mexican? And I, I, I spray painted him. No, I, um, <laughs> I looked at him, and I smiled at him. I mean, he's right here. He's right next to me. And I looked at him, and I smiled at him, and I said, do you know what I am? 
He goes, yeah, you're Italian, aren't you? Man, that got me mad. No, he... <laughs> I said, no, I'm Mexican. Oh, his face turned a variety of shades. It was, it was very pleasant to see. And he didn't know what to do. So he writes another note. <laughs> I'm serious. I feel, I fear that I have offended you greatly. Forgive me. And I smiled at him. And I wrote Galatians 3, the scripture I just read to you. We're one in Christ, bro. We're one in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, male, female, free man, slave. Or one, you've got to understand that. The Lord was teaching me that before I got saved. If this world's going to change, it's going to change because we love one another, not because we're always fighting against one another or placing my culture, my tastes, my language, my music, whatever it may be, above somebody else's. It isn't going to work that way. What's going to work in this world is getting past those things. Appreciating them? Yes, I appreciate them. If I'm in Israel, I have to find salsa. I have to. I will die without salsa. So I have to find it. I've had people bring it. They bring bottles for me. Because you got to have certain things in life. And not everybody appreciates that. I was in Scotland. One of my friends brought some Ortega chilies in a can. One of my friends is sitting down eating hoggish, you know, sheep stomach intestine or something. He's eating that. And the little waitress approaches me, and I have this can of Ortega chilies. And I say, can you open this for me so I can put it on my eggs? And she says to me, what is that? And I said, lizard skins. <laughs> they look like it. I thought she was going to puke. Now, how could she get so sick when this guy's eating sheep intestines? I don't know. But see, everybody, to, to each his own. Eskimos eat rotten walrus eyes. I won't do it. They do. Certain African tribesmen will take urine, blood, and milk, mix it together, and make a, a milkshake. They drink that. I won't. I love menudo. A lot of people don't. I understand. I understand. But it's the, it's the diversity that makes it so interesting. It's so interesting. So I love it. I love diversity. The body of Christ, being many, is one. So we bring our gifts. We bring the things that matter, the things that we have that we treasure and value. And we mix it together. And it makes for a beautiful church. And I love that. Don't you? I love that. I really do. I love that. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to be. You know, I had the Gutierrez brothers here years ago now in this room before we built that other building over there. And um, they sang a song in Spanish, which is fine with me. I mean, you want to sing, sing a song? I think God understands Spanish. I'm pretty sure he does. I get a letter from somebody. This is the United States. Speak English. I said, Raul, come on, man. Don't play it. <laughs> Don't do that, man. Don't be so mean. But that can be the mentality even in the body of Christ. I don't want to get too close to that person because that person isn't like me. Instead of rejoicing in the differences, we select people who are most like us. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I thank God for the different gifts, the different people, the different cultures, everything. Why? It makes us better because we're representing the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you're going to preach this message in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So the gospel goes out in all the languages, and those who are saved are brought into this body of Christ. We are one in the Lord. And so as family members, we need to love one another, but it's a process of learning too. 
In 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21, John said, If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he's a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So we are to love one another. We've been brought into the body of Christ by one spirit. The membership is not built on racial political or denominational connection. It's a membership of the Spirit made possible by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit has brought us into this. Now notice verse 13, all have been made to drink of the Spirit. Each member of the church has become a member by drinking of the Spirit. To drink means to be irrigated or to be watered or saturated by the Spirit of God. And so we're brought into the body of Christ by the Spirit himself. And he goes on in verse 14, for in fact, the body is not one member, but many. So again, salvation makes us all one in Jesus Christ. We are one in the spirit because of a shared faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Now, as this is true, notice verse 15. If, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? The whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? Now, many Corinthian believers were unhappy with their gifts, and they began to compare one, themselves with one another. Again, we've already noted that comparisons and jealousy and envy are sure signs of carnality. And so he begins to give to us insight into this division, and that's why in verses 15 through 17 he gives comparisons. If the foot should say, I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, well, verses 15 through 17 reveal an attitude that results in the quenching of the spirit and the quenching of ministry. Some will look around in a church and will say within themselves, I'm just not necessary. They don't need me. If I don't show up, they're not even going to notice. My gifts are not necessary here. And that's what happens in churches all the time. Yet on our bulletin, a lot of people haven't read the bulletin, I understand. We hand the bulletin out, people take it and may look at it a little bit, but not necessarily really look at it. We have placed on it since we began, almost since we began, in the very, very earliest days of this church, a phrase at the bottom. It says, every member, what? Have you read it? Every member, a minister. All of us. All of us. Why do you have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of what? For the work of ministry. Every member a minister reminds us that we all pull our own weight and the weight of others when necessary. That others ought not to be doing that which God has constructed me to do. That I shouldn't look to somebody else to do what my job is. Everybody knows this is true in your home. You know, Marie and I don't really have a division of labor. We don't have that in our house. She does all the work. <laughs> and it's a great life. No, we, we really don't. I mean, she thinks we have that in her mind. You know, I can't fold towels. I can't. I've tried. God knows I have. But I just don't do it right. You know, there are quite a number of things I don't do right. I don't wash the dishes right. I haven't ever. But that has kept me from washing dishes for many years. <laughs> but we really don't have what I would call a division of labor because work is work and it needs to be done, and so let's do it. If a front room needs to be vacuumed, why would I wait for somebody else to do it when I can do it myself, right? If a bathroom needs to be cleaned, why would I wait for somebody else to do it when I'm there and I'm able to do it? We haven't divided things up like that because it's our house. We don't have those divisions. We have what you call a common purse, meaning I make money and I put it in her purse. <laughs> <laughs> meaning that it's our money. I know that there are some people who think this is my check and this is my and this is hers and we don't play that. It's ours. Whatever the Lord has given to her is mine. Whatever he's given to me is hers. So it's ours. 
I discovered that the two become one and we're better together than separate. And so it works that way. And so our home's that way. Our life is that way. That doesn't mean that there's no leadership in the home. She knows who I am in the Lord, and I know who I am in the Lord. God has called me to be the priest of the house, to minister to my family. I understand that, that particular reality. But because we love one another, we work well together. And I have need of her, and she has need of me. And the two became one, and we're able to accomplish great things together. We're a team. The body of Christ is like that. And sometimes people will come into church and they'll say, Oh, somebody's already doing that. I'm not necessary. Oh, somebody over there is doing that. I'm not necessary. That's never true. That's never true. Your gifts are always necessary. They're always necessary. So what you do is you seek to be used of the Lord. Now put yourself in a position in terms of maturing and in your growth and all of that to be usable. But that's the bottom line. And so these comparisons that can take place in church and where people are starting to say, I'm not necessary, is something he's speaking about right now. He says in verse 18, um, but now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are some members, or many members, yet one body. And, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And so certain gifts were being exalted about other less obvious gifts. And the noticeable gifts are the ones that are being coveted. And so people begin to compare and begin to wish that they had more notoriety or fame or more recognition. Well, Paul is making it very clear. Instead of coveting somebody else's gifts, why don't you just trust the Lord who determines which gift you're going to possess? And God doesn't make mistakes when he determines your gifting. So don't envy somebody else's gifting. Just learn to use the gifts that he has given to you. The body is diverse. Each member has an important function. One person is not more important than the other. So don't exalt one gift over another. In verse 21, he says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't have a need of you. The head can't say that to the feet. And so the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. In other words, there were some saying, we don't really need you. You're simply not necessary. But the fact is, again, we need each other. And we have a built-in desire to be needed. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are intended to heal a broken body. When we had, um, and I always uh, share this kind of thing. You'll hear it long enough until it either you get so tired of it, you just uproot yourself and go plant yourself somewhere else or or you see the heart of the statement. Listen, I uh, started a Bible study in September of 1973 with a handful of people. We met in a house for a long time. Started another Bible study in September of 1974. Met in a house for a long time. Eventually started another study. Men in the house for a long time. Didn't have children's ministry. Didn't have music ministry. We only had uh, a couple, one couple, when this church was new, that played uh, musical instruments. But for the first several years of my ministry, from 1973 into the late 70s, we never even had music in our in Bible studies. I used to just come out, sit down, open my Bible. People would be fellowshipping. And when I opened my Bible and I looked at the time, because it was a small group of people, they all knew the Bible study started at 7 o'clock. They would look to me, I'd smile at them, and then I'd pray. And the study started. No singing, nothing. We just had a Bible study. But I really wanted to have worship. See, I can, I can teach a study, but wouldn't it be great to have somebody who could play a guitar and sing? I want the body of Christ to use its gifts, right? I still remember the couple that I had leading worship at the home study. We finally had a couple who was able to do that, calling me up just before the study saying, I'm sorry, we're not going to make it. 
there was one guy in the Bible study, his name was Clint. And he knew how to lead worship, and he happened to be there that night, was in the home. And I walked up to him, and I said, Clint, Doug and Stacy can't make it to the study tonight. Can you lead worship? And he said, I'm sorry, I didn't bring my guitar. And I said, that's okay, sing a cappella. He says, I don't know any Italian songs. And, and <laughs> true story, <laughs> I don't know any Italian songs. A cappella means without musical accompaniment. Just lead us with your voice, okay, duh. <laughs> we needed his gifting. We need one another. We shouldn't get caught up comparing gifts or wishing I had this person's gift or that person should never wish he had my gift. When I teach uh, pastors, because we have pastors' classes, um, I will share to the guys who want to go out and plant churches, the worst thing you can do is try to use me as your model. It is the worst thing. You, you, you don't want to. What you need is to be yourself. Because if you've ever wished that you were somebody else, you need to stop and think for a minute. If you were somebody else, then one of you isn't necessary. There has to be just you, your gift, the way you do things. That's what makes the body rich. Not when you clone yourself after somebody else and try and be like somebody else. Be like the Lord as he works through you. Be yourself. Because, again, when this church first began, Pastor Chuck's fellowship is only 40 minutes away. Rawl at that time was in West Covina, 20, 25 minutes away. Greg Laurie is 25, 20, 25 minutes away. Chuck Swindoll was at AV Free Church, 20 minutes away. You know, John MacArthur is about an hour and 15 minutes away. There's a lot of teachers all around the area, and I began to pray and ask the Lord, who am I supposed to be like? And the Lord said, you're supposed to be like yourself. That's who you're supposed to be like. Don't try to be who you're not. Be who you are. And just exercise your gifts as God gave them to you. Because that's what makes the body what it's supposed to be. And instead of coveting somebody else's gift and say, gosh, I wish that I could speak like this or I had the kind of ministry of that. And it's the un most unwise thing you can do. Just rejoice in what God has done in you. Just enjoy him as you are. And watch what the Lord will do through you. The Corinthians were so busy comparing one and themselves amongst themselves and were so busy saying, I'm not necessary, or somebody else is saying, you're not necessary. It just wasn't working anymore. And so we need each other. The Holy Spirit's gifts are intended to make this broken body into a healed one. God didn't redeem us for ourselves. What God wants to do is create a new community. And this community is supposed to evidence his presence. It's supposed to be a community that is cemented by his love and is to be known by service and compassion. Now, in verse 22, he says, No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. Christianity is not a system where only the strong survive. We are to be mutually dependent on one another. The fact is we are needed and everybody is necessary. We need to understand that. You are needed and you are necessary. God tried to teach me that before I was saved. I had a guy in high school, his name was David. David was uncoordinated. And so when we were in gym, we would play basketball. We would choose up sides. Dave never got chosen for anybody's team because David couldn't play basketball. David was 15. I was 15 years old at the time. I can still remember this very well because we were playing a, a game during gym. We 
We chose up sides. Nobody chose David. And I looked at David, and I said to him, Dave, I said, sorry, man. You're on nobody's team. Nobody chose you. David was a tall, kind of uh, lanky kid. And uh, I basically had grown up with him from the time I was very small, and now we're in high school together. And I'll never forget David when I said, nobody chose you, man. You're not going to play. I remember him running off the court, running into a little alcove there right off the gym, putting his hands over his face and beginning to sob like a little kid. And I'm a 15-year-old high school kid. We're not known for compassion at 15. But that touched me. And I remember walking up to him, seeing this big kid cry. It still touches me. I said, what's with you, man? Why are you crying? And he said this. I'll never forget. He said, I've been practicing every day. He said, my dad put up a hoop at my house so I could shoot baskets to learn how to play so that one day I'd be chosen for someone's team. And I looked at this guy. I don't know. I was a stupid 15-year-old. What do I know? But I said, you can be on my team. And I brought him onto the court. We started throwing the ball to him. He started missing shots, which he did. <laughs> Couldn't even hit the backboard. Go home and practice more, David. But when he would miss his shot, I started turning to him, and then the other guys did on the team. And I started saying, great shot, man. Good try. Great shot. Good try. And it was then that the Lord began something in my heart. I get, I get emotional. Forgive me. But I remember I didn't have a heart for people who didn't fit in. I do now, but I didn't then. You had to pass muster. You had to be the best, or I didn't want anything to do with you. If we're going to play sports, I want the best team. I don't want some guy who can't even catch a ball or hit it. I don't want somebody who can't run to first base or catch a pass. I only want the best. The Lord taught me a long time ago, since I was 15, everybody's important. Everybody. That's what I've learned through Christ, though. The body of Christ is one, and you are necessary. Your gifts are. The things you have to offer to the Lord are very important. Don't ever let anybody tell you otherwise. You are, in the sight of the Lord, necessary. And the church is better for you because God brought you into it for a reason. What you need to learn is what that reason is. What's the purpose? What do you want me to do, Lord? And when you find that place, you're satisfied in Jesus. You're satisfied in him. And you don't have to compare yourself with somebody else. And you don't have to say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not an ear, I'm not a hand, I'm not a foot, I'm not necessary. And nobody can say, you're not necessary. Because if you had an option right now, if you were standing up here and, and say, I was saying to you, okay, we're going to take one of the members off your body. You know, what don't you want? Can we cut off your hand? No. Can we cut off your ear? No. How about cutting off your nose? Well, a little, no, the whole thing. <laughs> How about a foot? Don't you think that every part of your body is pretty important? I don't want to lose any of it, except maybe some of the fat. <laughs> but I don't want to lose a part. Well, if I value my body that much, don't you think the Lord values the body of Christ? Don't you think we ought to? I would say yes. Paul is saying that. It is very unwise to divide the body of Christ up into special gifts and less special gifts because you're all necessary. We have been brought into this body by one spirit. We have all drunk of this one spirit. God has gifted us. We are necessary. And that's what Paul is saying. Don't be divisive. And finally, when he says in verse 28, God has appointed those in the church, first apostles, 
second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. God is the one who sets the members just as he desires, and he has appointed some to offices, and he's given out gifts. What he wants us to do, though, is to seek, even as he says in verse 31, what is the best gift? What is the best gift? The gift that is necessary at the moment. What do I seek the Lord for? That which is best for now and for my life and for others. But what is it that will make all of this possible? Well, he tells us. He says in verse 31, yet I show you a more excellent way. We'll look at that more excellent way next time we get together.